This is Talk of the Nation. I'm Ray Suarez. Memes this hour on the program. What's a meme? It's an idea, a symbol, a piece of knowledge that can easily pass from person to person, from place to place, to borrow from the Book of Common Prayer, by thought, word, and deed. So what? Well, we're a country in the midst of a world, churning out memes as much as consumer durables, and I figure a look at how ideas zip around the world, how we end up knowing the things we know in the massive storage house of our brains, can be useful. An intriguing idea is to compare the movement of memes around the world to the way people pass genes or diseases from person to person, starting from one place and moving to every corner of the world. We'll talk about memes and perhaps pass some on this hour. We'll begin with Richard Dawkins, author of The Selfish Gene, in which he coined the word and introduced the idea of the meme. He's professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford University. Good to have you with us, sir. Thank you. Well, this was in the uh, closing chapter of The Selfish Gene, and uh, here was the birth pangs of the meme. Uh, now that it uh, is an idea that's being written about and talked about, um, are you glad you passed on the meme meme in the first place? Yes, I was fairly cautious when I first suggested it. It was, came at the end of The Selfish Gene, which is a book about genes, as you might expect, a book about the Darwinian role of genes. Uh, Darwinian natural selection is an immensely powerful force which has given rise to all of life, as you know. And it is about the differential survival of anything that self-replicates. In the case of true Darwinism, that means DNA. But I thought maybe there's something else other than DNA that might be the basis for some kind of Darwinian process. The meme, which your definition was admirable, the meme was a suggested uh, second candidate for a self-replicating entity in a Darwinian process. But I guess the real problem I have is with agency. Uh, we are sticky, uh, human beings are, our intellects are, are sticky. And we sort of catch things as they pass by. Um, that's not so much in the nature of what it is that's passing by as in the nature of us. Well, that's true. And uh, in just the same kind of way, genes too are not agents. Uh, genes too uh, behave a little bit like agents, and you can understand the Darwinian process if you make a kind of uh, leap of imagination and treat them as though they were agents. But of course, you always have to remember that actually they're not. And the same applies to means. So while we can understand uh, people acting in certain ways, impelled to move their genes on, what would act to more successfully move memes on? Well, um, any difficulties you have with genes are the same as you might have with memes. And we don't deliberately act to move our genes on, but we are pre-programmed by our genes with nervous systems that make us behave as if we were moving to pass them on. And in the same way, a meme like uh, believe in God or believe that if you sin before you die, you'll go to hell after you die. Those means both tend to pass on to um, not future generations but to other brains because they have what it takes to impress brains and get themselves passed on. Are there times where you are cited in articles or uh, memetics is described where you find yourself thinking, uh-oh, that's a little further than I want to go. Yes, there are. Um, if you look up mimetics on the World Wide Web, you'll find literally thousands of references to it. And some of them are fairly flaky. Some of them are really rather good. So I do have a certain amount of uneasiness. By the way, it, the, the term meme is very often used without citing me. And that's very good because the Oxford Dictionary um, has just included the word in the dictionary. And the Oxford Dictionary's criterion for including a word is that it should be used without reference to where it comes from. So I'm pleased that the word meme is being used 
uh, without reference to where it comes from. Well, that may be a milestone in scholarship itself, uh, an academic saying that he's glad to see his ideas mentioned without having his own name in there. That's right. It's an achievement in mimetics. <laughs> Professor Dawkins, thanks for being with us this hour. Thank you very much. Richard Dawkins is author of The Selfish Gene, the book in which he coined the word and introduced the idea of the meme, professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford University and joined us from Oxford. With us for the rest of the hour is Susan Blackmore, author of The Meme Machine, senior lecturer in psychology at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Good to have you with us. Hello. And Robert Wright is here in Studio 3A in Washington, author of The Moral Animal, Evolutionary Psychology and Everyday Life. Welcome back. Thank you. Our number in Washington is 800-989-8255. That's 800-989-TALK. Well, Susan Blackmore, uh, you took Richard Dawkins' ball and uh, continued to run it downfield. Tell us a little bit more about uh, the ways you wanted to refine and further explain his first basic idea. I'm sure that's a reference to some game I know nothing about, <laughs> but uh, yes, I, I, that's what I did. Um, his idea has been around a long time. The Selfish Gene was 1976, and I knew about it then, and it didn't somehow get to me until three or four years ago. I was very ill, and I was lying in bed for months, and I started reading all my favorite evolution books again, including The Selfish Gene, and I suddenly realized what the implications of his idea were that if you treat everything that we imitate from person to person, everything that is copied um, around the world from one person to another as a replicator, then you can apply all of evolutionary theory um, to what's going on. The implications are quite staggering and what I tried to do in that book was to spell them out. For example, you've raised the issue of agency. If you really buy Darwin's idea that design comes about because of the competition between replicators to get copied, then you start to see everything that happens in the human mind and in human culture as designed by the evolutionary algorithm running on memes, by memes competing to get into our brains, rather than us as autonomous agents. Uh, there are many other implications, but I tried to spell all these out in the book. And it seems to me that this is a fundamentally new way of looking at why human beings are the way they are. But certain memes uh, of attain wide frequency after some time uh, because of their tremendous appeal, but not particularly because of any value in the imitation. Absolutely right. And this is one of the strengths of meme theory. You see, I, I think most memes probably succeed because they're in some way useful to us or to our genes. And the genes are, if you like, bearing in mind Richard Dawkins' caution about saying these things, the genes are, if you like, trying all the time to make sure that we only pick up memes that are useful to them, things that will help us survive, and so on. But the value of the mimetic view is that you realize that, that lots of memes get passed on even though they are not valuable, not true, not useful. They, if you like, use tricks. Richard Dawkins there um, mentioned religions and he's well known for his theory that religions are viruses of the mind. They are viruses in the sense that they are a copy me instruction, pass on this idea about God or virgin birth or whatever it is, backed up with threats and promises, and that gets them around. But another example might be, you know, those awful computer viruses, um, uh, internet viruses, you know, pen pals greetings, do not pass this on. If you, if you get this in your computer, it will destroy your hard disk. Now, these are very successful because they play tricks on us. They make us want to be altruistic and help our friends by passing on the warning, um, and they, they use threats and promises. So this mimetic view, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is this. We mustn't think that all mimetics is about viral memes, but, but the, the reason that we often emphasize those ones is because they make clear the point that what's in our heads is a lot of it is good and useful stuff, but a lot of it is memes that just got there because they could. Well, for those listeners, I'm sure, who are many who are just hearing about this for the first time, and they've never seen the word M-E-M-E, -M -E, except perhaps written with an accent circumflex over the top, <laughs> Very and good. Meaning, meaning something totally different. Uh, give us some examples of, of what 1999 Westerners might recognize as, as memes. Oh, well, trendy trainers. Um, I don't know what you, <laughs> what's the latest trendy thing. Shootings in schools, I'm afraid to say. 
um, you know, violence is, is not a meme. It's somehow inherent in, in human nature. But, but the way that it's done is probably copied from person to person, school to school. Um, advertisements. Uh, jingles on your lovely music. People hear it every week and they think, ah, that's my favorite program. Um, ways of saying uh, hi or you're welcome or whatever strange things you um, say over there. Um, things that you eat, uh, fashions in food. I'd like to think of it this way. We learn a lot of things for ourselves and by ourselves. The skill of riding a bike or surfing or whatever. These we learn by ordinary learning for ourselves. But anything which we get by copying it from somebody else, that's a meme. So every story we know, every song we can sing, every scientific theory that we've ever learned, these things are all memes. In other words, you know, our culture is, is a mass of memes. Robert Wright is with us here in Washington, author of The Moral Animal, Evolutionary Psychology and Everyday Life, and you've been working for years to try to understand the origin of, uh, of human variability. Are you comfortable with the idea that knowledge has uh, an organic parallel? Uh, I am, broadly speaking. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, that idea itself is not new. The idea that cultural evolution is in some ways parallel to genetic evolution it goes back uh, to Darwin's day. In fact, in The Origin of Species, Darwin himself brings up the evolution of languages as, as an example to try to drive home what he's talking about uh, with natural selection. And, and after, uh, after Darwin's day, cultural evolutionism was the rage in anthropology and sociology for quite a while. And I think certainly there is value in, in looking at culture as a, as a body of information that evolves. Um, I think the question is, uh, what is new about the concept of the meme and how valuable it is? I think certainly the name is valuable. For one thing, it's catchy. It's a good meme. Uh, it sounds a little like Gene, which is appropriately suggestive. So I think it was well chosen. If, if you ask what is really new about the concept of the meme, I think the main thing is the willingness of Dawkins and others to view memes as really active. He, he denied that, that they had literal agency, but at the same time, his emphasis is on a, 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 a fairly thorough comparison with genes in the sense that you view the units of culture as self-replicating so that a song I whistle kind of manipulates your brain into whistling it rather than you choosing to, to whistle the song. That's what's new, uh, I think, about the concept of the, of the meme. And I think the jury is still out on how, how academically useful that's going to be. I think the idea appeals to people more and more because uh, in the information age, people feel almost under assault from, from uh, you know, bits of information uh, uh, coming at them from all sides. So I think the concept is probably going to catch on more and more, and certainly the name is as well. And I, I think within academia, uh, the jury's still somewhat out, although I certainly found uh, Su Susan's book uh, fascinating. Well, even people who doubt its scientific validity are uh, sort of charmed by its metaphorical uh, way of explaining how knowledge moves around. Could it have a valid life on that level? Oh, on those grounds alone. A lot of things are with us just because they're, they're good metaphors. And, and I, I think the concept of the, of the meme is here, is, is here to stay, stay. And in fact, it predates uh, Dawkins' coining the term. And I think the term is here to stay. stay. Uh, and I think it's a good way to talk about the modern world where there are all these discrete bits of information that you can trace that are flying around on the Internet. Uh, and and it, it makes sense at that level. A little of that mimetic music. You're listening to Talk of the Nation. I'm Ray Suarez. We're going to take a short break right now. When we return, we'll continue talking about memes and whether they can help us understand complex aspects of human nature and culture. And we'll begin taking your calls at 800-989-8255. Or you can email us at totm at npr dot org. Welcome back to the program. I'm Ray Suarez. Today we're talking about memes, ideas or human behaviors which some scientists claim can be passed on from one person to another like genes. My guests are Susan Blackmore, author of The Meme Machine, 
and senior lecturer in psychology at the University of the West of England in Bristol. She joins us from the BBC studios in Bristol. And Robert Wright is here in Washington, author of The Moral Animal, Evolutionary Psychology and Everyday Life. The number here in Washington is 800-989-8255. And I guess um, one thing that, that uh, flummoxes, me, flummoxes me about this is utility. Uh, there is some of this that you can explain by using utility, uh, and certainly Darwin's theories had a lot to do with adaptation that helped preserve and, and move forward a species. But um, knowing, as I do, even at this late date, 35-year-old television jingles, uh, which were very successful memes, um, doesn't help me at all. <laughs> no, and that's one of the strong points uh, about memetics. If you really take seriously the idea that memes are just in it for their own replication, then it, uh, they don't care, if you like, whether they are useful for you or whether they're useful for your genes. They will simply get copied if your brain copies them and not if they don't. So, of course, our brains get try and keep all the useful ideas but end up with a whole lot of useless ones. And you see, genes are only passed on from parent to child, and they will only be passed on if the parent survives and has children. But memes are passed on very, very quickly, all around the world very fast. There isn't time for the genes to keep up. So if we have memes that kill us off, it, they won't kill us off, you know, they'll, they'll still spread. For example, birth control memes are very successful. They are not useful for our genes, but they're spreading very fast. Even martyrdom, you might say, um, can spread <clears throat> religious memes, um, it kills off the person who, who, who dies, but that doesn't matter the memes. If they can spread, they will. But Robert Wright, I'm not going to teach my eight-year-old daughter the theme to the Patty Duke show, which I could sing night, right now. Uh, that's probably not, and I'll pause and let you if you'd like. <laughs> but, uh, I could do it too, by the way. Uh, oh, go on, both of you do it for me. I've never heard it. <laughs> uh, consider yourself lucky. Patty's on the theme <laughs> right. sites a girl can see from Brooklyn Heights. But uh, anyway... Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's true that, uh, I mean, it gets back to, to one thing that's kind of undeniable in, in, what, uh, in, the, in the idea of the meme is that when, when somebody picks up a habit, a habit spreads or an idea spreads, all you can say for sure is that the habit or the idea was conducive to its own replication. Right. It may or may not be good for the person uh, with the habit. I mean, heroin addiction, for example, keeps spreading. It is manifestly bad for, for the people, but if it, it, in a sense, replicates itself fast enough, uh, it can keep spreading. Now, I think when you get to the question of how often are memes uh, good for the people, there, even among memeticists, there's a difference of opinion, I think, and I think actually Susan may agree here, that, that among a lot of memeticists, they're, they're is excessive cynicism in a certain sense. There, there, there is too much willingness to kind of assume that every meme is a virus and it's bad for, for, for the person but good for itself. And I think uh, comparisons, especially in the realm of religion, I think it's Dawkins uh, has compared belief in God to a virus. My own view is, is that belief in God, regardless of its truth, is very often good for the person believing it and is very often good for the society in which it thrives. So I, I, I think... Uh, well, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to say that, to some extent, at least an empirical question. I mean, you've raised the question there. Because Dawkins said this, we can actually have a go at testing it. There is evidence that people are happier if they believe in God than if they don't. Right. And I mean, the cause and effect relationships are tricky there, but this rather backs up your view. But, I, but I'd like to say something about this, why memeticists concentrate on viruses. I, I think you're right, and I think it's dangerous, because I certainly don't want to say that most memes are viral. All of science is memes, and, you know, that's useful to us in, in many ways. New ways of producing food and, and things like this, which are clearly conducive to our survival, these are all memes. But I think the thing is that um, a, a, an evolutionary psychologist like yourself wouldn't be surprised at these. They, they would follow from many other theories. Where memetics differs is in understanding the viral ones, and perhaps that's why we could be accused of kind of overdoing it on the viral front. Well, I, I think there is a way to think of this that does talk about uh, human utility and, and leave the, the meme as a, an unthinking, unfeeling, agency-less item. Uh, you know, one of the things that genes do is save us from having to 
recode every single new individual in every species in the world. Mm -hmm. In effect, you get a couple of hundred thousand years of distilled history handed on to you in uh, in the two X's or the X and the Y that uh, that you <laughs> that you get past. Um, so similarly, memes save you from having to be totally sui generis. You right. are not a person who has to build themselves from the ground up from, from the very day you start to acquire knowledge. Instead, you get distilled bits of knowledge constantly passed on to you. Some of it's been tested for its utility. Some of it hasn't. Some of it's just been tested for its appeal. Some of it just gets loaded into the, the bushel basket of your head just because it's there. But you uh, are saving an awful lot of time. Every time somebody says, take a left there instead of a right, you don't have to first take a right to see if it's better to take a right or a left in order to test every testable proposition. That memes are just tremendous time savers, thought savers, effort savers. Um, they're not viral at all. They're, they're sort of neutral in that regard. And that's why it's worth carrying the burden of the rubbish ones because most of them are, are, are doing us such a good, good time. Right. Uh, although I think that certainly the environment has changed, as you point out in your book, Susan, and, and uh, now it is easier for memes that are not good for us to spread than it was back when, say, you know, we lived in a hunter-gatherer society and we got many of our memes from our parents who more or less had our, had our welfare uh, at heart and culture didn't evolve so fast uh, yeah. back then. The implications of this are quite scary in some ways. What, I, what I've tried to think about is what happens as mimetic evolution goes faster and faster and is more horizontal, that is, between people of the same age rather than down the generations. And you're right, the grip of the genes begins to be loosened because it's no longer true that it matters much to our genes. And, and I think a general process is going on any time you have a replicator, whether it's genes or means or any other replicator, what happens is the replicator and the machinery that copies it evolve together. I've argued in the book that our big, enormous human brains, specially adapted for language and so on, were actually evolved along with the memes to suit the memes. And what the memes are doing now is creating new apparatus for copying them. So, I mean, if you think, what, what apparatus is there around copying memes at the moment? Well, it's all the, what we're using now, the radio studios and the tape recorders, books, uh, computers, the internet. Now, it may sound bizarre to say the memes have created these things, but I think that's a good way of looking at it. It's that co-evolutionary process that, pr that develops the memes and the meme copying apparatus. So when you look at the internet, this has not much to do with, with genes. It still has a connection, and, and Robert is, is an expert on all the connections to do, to do with sex and so on, um, as how we're set up to choose certain kinds of memes but it's rapidly getting, getting away. And as soon as the um, memes get so far that they can produce self-replicating computers and so on on the internet, and um, sort of mimetic rather than human ways of copying editing text, it will be clear that it's way, way out of our control. And we need to, we need to face up to that and start trying to understand the process that's going on there. Jill writes from Fairbanks, Alaska, I recently read an article in which Mr. Dawkins mentioned demonstrating a complex transforming origami figure that ultimately perpetuated as a meme. Where can I find directions for that fascinating figure? Sounds like even more fun than that other ubiquitous hand-me-down paper toy, the cootie catcher, which as the father of a second grader, I hadn't even seen a cootie catcher in 35 years, didn't know they still existed, and then I saw my daughter playing with one the other day. Uh, Bob writes from Minneapolis, correlation does not prove causality. Just because memes may act like other natural phenomena does not mean that they have any other relationships. Unfortunately, New Age pseudoscientists seeking the mystical in the scientific attempt to bolster their beliefs with such examples as memetics. Once again, however, the ends don't justify the memes. Oh, Bob, I think you might have written the whole letter just so you could say that. And Joseph writes from Madison, Connecticut. Dear Ray, I teach graphic design at the university level, and I use the meme in educating my students about the origins of symbolic meaning. One of my favorite examples of a meme is the arrow, that is, the pointed thing that is not only an actual object with aerodynamic properties, but also the symbolic thing that points us in directions or shows us where to go. The arrow was, <clears throat> the arrow was probably originally a sharp stick used to hunt animals, 
This evolved into a sharpened stone, a metal point, a bullet, a rocket, a nuclear missile, a man on the moon, and probably a million other things, too. The pointed direction thing, that is, the arrow, was adapted symbolically, probably as a rough mark carved on a tree or on the ground to show where game was located, food for the tribe. This in turn meant direction too. We use thousands of symbolic arrows every day, in, out, this exit, this way to restrooms, push here, forward, backward, the mouse arrow in our computer interface, and owe this method of communication to our hunting ancestors. So I half-jokingly ask my students, what if civilization had started in Australia? Would we be using the boomerang to show direction instead? Memes are no gimmick. They're real things that shape our civilization and direction as a species, socially, culturally, and in ways we have yet to discover. So, a little skeptical reaction and, a, and someone who seems to be really sold on the idea. Susan Blackmore... Uh, you want me to comment on that? Well, yeah, that, that last one especially, where... Uh, oh, well, I agree. It, it's interesting that she, she relates it to, to symbolism. I don't do that. I personally have trouble with understanding what a symbol is, although that might sound odd, but the more you think about it, the more tricky it becomes. And one of the things I quite like about memetics is you can, if you wish, stick to the behaviors, the artifacts. You can stick, if you like, to the arrows themselves, the drawings of the arrows. And in that sense, I agree with her wholeheartedly. It's an excellent example. When it comes to symbolism, I'm a little more dodgy. But I must say something about the skeptical guy because he has completely misunderstood memetics if he thinks it's kind of pseudoscientific mystical. It may be wrong science, it may be useless science, it may be all kinds of things and, and, and end up needing to be thrown out and I could be wrong. But I will not accept that it is, is somehow mystical and pseudoscientific. Um, some people misinterpret the memetic idea as though memes are somehow... I don't know, little sort of spiritual entities that kind of hop out of your head and jump into somebody else's. And I must make it clear that that's not what's meant. All that's meant is that every time somebody copies somebody else, hears a story and passes it on, that is what we call a, name, a meme. We're just giving a name to the information that is copied. There's nothing spooky. There's nothing paranormal or psychic going on. Uh, you know, this is real science we're dealing with here. Whether it's right or wrong, we have to find out in the future. San Francisco is our next stop. Bob, welcome to the program. Thanks. Um, the problem I'm having with this memes concept is uh, that it seems to uh, be kind of a zero-sum game between locating the agency in the meme and locating the agency in the mind of uh, the people that are perpetuating these memes. And uh, this uh, is at odds with one of my favorite memes, which is that the nature of people is that we're organisms that pretty much define our own nature. Um, and I guess what I'm really saying is meme to me basically means our scenes. Uh, I know nothing about memes aside from what I've heard on this program, but uh, it seems that you're basically using memes to mean idea. And it seems that my understanding of ideas is we can kind of accept them or reject them as we choose. So I'd much rather locate the uh, agency in the, in the mind of the person than in the meme itself. Uh, it's a fair point. First of all, I, I don't like to equate memes entirely with ideas. Many ideas are memes, but if you have an idea that you invented by yourself or yourself without any help of anybody else, that's not a meme. By definition, memes have to be passed from, from person to person. Now, as far as the agency is concerned, I'm not saying that memes are entirely the agents and humans have nothing to do with it. Rather, I'm saying the ordinary view might be we humans are the agents and we consciously and deliberately choose to do this to pick up that idea or whatever. The new view, the memetic view, is that there are memes and there are meme machines, that's us, and as meme machines, our brains are set up to select some memes and not others, to try and filter out the bad ones and pick up the good ones, which we sometimes succeed and sometimes fail. It's an interactive process between the memes, which are copied or not, and our brains, which are copying machines. And in that sense, it's an evolutionary process as goes on with genes. And evolutionary processes give rise to novel design. And that's why I like this, because you do away with any kind of ghost in the machine idea. But you don't do away with the idea that humans are, 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 take an active role in the process. You're we and the memes go along together. You're listening to Talk of the Nation from NPR News. Robert Wright? Yeah, well, I certainly agree that if you want to, you can turn things around and view the memes as active. And in fact, we often speak this way. We talk about an arresting idea, you know, someone who is seized by an idea or something. Uh, I, uh, but equally, as Bob points out, you can talk about the, the humans as being uh, the more active force. 
And the question is how much value is added by inverting the normal worldview and, and viewing the memes as in the driver's seat. Uh, and it's not yet clear to me that there's a whole lot. I mean, certainly the idea that Susan alluded to earlier that sometimes we, you know, there are parts of culture that aren't good for us and yet we host them anyway. Uh, you can describe things like that uh, without, uh, you know, uh, attributing anything like uh, agency or, or great activism uh, to the memes themselves. Uh, the, now, the, the other thing Susan was saying just a minute ago about uh, the kind of uh, scary future in which memes will be more and more in charge is just is interesting because it, it gets back to kind of an old science fiction motif, you know, kind of at what point does the technology that humans have created begin to, in some sense, take over? And that, that's actually uh, an idea in, the, in this movie, The Matrix, for example, most recently. But I think uh, precisely because technology itself is certainly more and more animated uh, and, and is moving faster and faster, uh, that's, I think that's one reason that the concept of the, the meme uh, has some valence these days and, and, and people are, are, are find it intriguing, at least. Carl writes from Watertown, Massachusetts. One thing to consider about this concept is that it may mask the influence of power and money on what we think, believe, and induce our friends and children to reproduce. There are people and organizations that have greater ability to produce stable, hardy memes than others. There are people and organizations that have a greater ability to disseminate memes into the population. Right now, Mass media seems to have a prominent monopoly on both the ability to produce hardy memes and the means to disseminate them. And we know how concentrated the control over these media currently are. What do you think? Actually, I think in some ways the control over the media are growing less concentrated uh, by the day, certainly. I mean, anyone can, can set up their own web page. Uh, and so, in a certain sense, uh, and, and you know, soon the, the web will be broad bandwidth, and there will be TV. So, in a certain sense, the, this business I think is getting democratized, uh, and we've come a long way from the day when there were three or four channels on TV. And I think we'll we'll keep moving in that direction. Yeah, but you could put up your own web page with a picture of a a soft drink bottle, and you wouldn't have the same power as Coke to reproduce that curvy, slim hip thing, the Coke bottle, out into the, the rest of the world. No, that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. I would, I would start small if I were an aspiring meme engineer. You're listening to Talk of the Nation. I'm Ray Suarez. My guests are Robert Wright and Susan Blackmore. We're going to take a short break right now. When we return, we'll continue talking about the meme and whether it can help us better understand human nature and culture or whether it's just cocktail party science. And we'll take more of your calls at 800 989-8255. Welcome back to the program. I'm Ray Suarez. Tune in at this time tomorrow to join Ira Flato for the next Science Friday. He'll be in conversation with Nobel laureate Carrie Mullis, who invented a way of copying small fragments of DNA. And if you're listening to KCUR Radio, I'll be in your neighborhood tomorrow at lunchtime speaking at the Mid-America Regional Council talking about uh, sustainable urban development. And then tomorrow night in an event sponsored by KCUR, your local public radio station, I'll be talking at Unity Temple in Kansas City. So uh, give the station a call if you want more information. Today we're talking about memes, what they are, do they actually exist, and whether they can help us understand complex aspects of human nature and culture. My guests are Susan Blackmore, author of The Meme Machine, and a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of West England in Bristol, and Robert Wright, author of The Moral Animal, Evolutionary Psychology and Everyday Life. Our number is 800-989-8255, and Bronwyn is with us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Hi, Bronwyn. Hi, hi. Um, I have an experience sometimes when I watch um, ads on television, which... Uh, resonates with what your guest is talking about. I I really like to watch ads. I'm very interested in them as you know art, and I think of myself as having a kind of distance from them. But every once in a while, I just feel like a little ping or something, and and I just realize that all of a sudden I want that thing for a minute. I think, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and buy that thing. So it's very strange, and it is almost like an infection. 
And then you speak about like what use or something like say an ad. Well, I think it just speaks to some need that we have for, you know, beauty or style. Same thing with slang. It just speaks to something, uh, some need for something that you'd have to call beauty or style or. So Bronwyn, do you resist? I usually resist. Yeah. Well, I usually once I've noticed it, I think it kind of it kind of dies down once I've seen that oh, that happened. Right. Or else it's just something too expensive that I can't possibly afford. But if you don't realize it, you're in trouble. Yeah. It's been a very successful transfer into right. your head there. Right. <laughs> Well, Bronwyn, I'm sure the, I'm sure the ad people are uh, are just hoping that you don't realize it more often than you do. Yeah, I think they're counting on that. Uh, advertising, Susan Blackmore may um, I know that memeplex is uh, is, is sort of another level of uh, of um, sophistication of what you're talking about, but certainly people who want to push a lot of buttons in 30 seconds. Uh, bundle up memes and throw them at you in a great big bunch uh, sometimes. Uh, oh, yes. And you can think of uh, the advertising agencies as being, as having been memetic engineers for a long time without calling themselves that. They have found many of the tricks. I suspect with, with a lot more study of memes, they'll find some tricks that they haven't stumbled across already. But they're using tricks which get ideas into our, into our brains. Uh, as Bronwyn mentioned, sometimes it's because they're beautiful or they really pull our heartstrings emotionally. That's some of the reasons they get in, but other reasons are, are, are nastier reasons they get in because they frighten us, because they bring up um, you know, deep-seated, genetically-based emotional reactions and so on. But, uh, oh, they're the past masters of getting mean plexes that, that will make us do what they want us to do. But don't forget that we do have a kind of immune reaction. It's, it's well known in, in, from psychological research that even very young, kids are quite well able to discriminate the TV program from the adverts, and for very good re reason, we separate those two aspects out um, reasonably thoroughly. Um, and, and they're quite well able to, to separate them. And very early on, kids become quite cynical. Oh, I'm not going to buy that because it tells me to. So the advertisers have to work harder and harder to, uh, to get Bronwyn and all those kids not to notice that they're having their string pulled. Bronwyn, thanks a lot for your call. Robert Wright, um, a lot of the focus on these kinds of conversations for the past hundred years have been speculations on why humans have such big brains. And there's Bronwyn uh, using her discernment that having a big brain has given her to sort through all her experiences and recognize that she's being sucked in. Uh, but there we are using memes as efficient ways of uh, transmitting emotion whole long uh, lists of associations that we don't have to go through one by one because we're just throwing the meme out there. Uh, there's, there's a case to be made for the big brain in the case of uh, watching that TV commercial and knowing you're being had, and a case for not needing such a big brain because if we strip down our language uh, and just trade memes like bottle caps, uh, we don't have to have the big brain. Right. Uh, I, I think there's no doubt that, that culture, and you can call that memes if you want, uh, was a big part of the evolution, the genetic evolution of the human brain. And, and the brain is designed to, among other things, uh, process culture. Now, I think uh, that, uh, as has been suggested, the brain is, is designed, among other things, to fend off memes that are not likely to be useful. I think that the brain is a, a fairly discriminating um, emulator. Uh, and I think Susan may have a somewhat different view. I got the impression from, from, from her book that she does. And, and this is one reason that uh, I, I, I'm a little reluctant to kind of uh, wholly invert my view and, uh, and, and see the memes as in charge, partly because people are so discriminating. Uh, you know, when those advertisers are trying to push our buttons, they, they're trying to push the buttons of human nature. They have to contend with, with, with human nature, and they, and they have to be very sly to do it well. And I think that will always be the case. I mean, memes will always have to grapple with human nature. And so it's, it's not clear to me that at any point it really makes sense to say uh, the memes are in charge now. 
Oh, you've, you've picked on a really important argument here, Robert, and one that's been kind of uh, it's picking up momentum since the book came out, um, which is only a few weeks ago. In the book, I think, as, as you know, I made an argument that the memes had forced the genes to produce a big brain for their own benefit, similarly to what I was arguing earlier about the memes making the Internet and so on for their own spread. And I kind of implied that, um, the, that the big brain was completely useless to the genes and that it was only there for the memes and that you know the, the genes had lost out kind of thing. And to some extent, that's the way I was thinking about it. I suppose because of the newness of this idea of the memes as a replicator forcing the genes to do their bidding. But since then, a lot of people, you and, and other people, have pointed out, but hang on a minute, what the brain's really doing is much more interesting and selective than that. It's actually trying to make sure that it chooses memes that are good for the genes and rejects the others and it doesn't altogether succeed. So I think we can have many different views here about the, the relationship between memes and genes and how this big brain came about. about. I will s stick out my neck and say for sure I think that the memes have forced the genes hand, but just how much the, the brain is, is a selective mechanism, just, just, just whether it's, it's, it's kind of like a symbiotic thing or, 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 or whether the memes are a parasite, I think we've got a lot more discussion and a lot more investigation to do before we're clear about that. Seattle is our next stop. Liz, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm an anthropologist who works in culture and psychiatry, and my question for the guests is, how do memes and evolutionary psychology explain self-destructive behavior and things like innovative or creative ways of being masochistic? <laughs> Who's going to go first? Well, <laughs> my view on that is not especially mimetic, but I think a lot of things that are called self-destructive behavior are not in any sense purposely, even at an unconscious level, self-destructive. I mean, drug addicts, for example, uh, they're doing something people are designed by evolution to do, which is when something feels good, you do it again. That's positive reinforcement. The thing is that during evolution, the things that felt good were generally good for you, like going out and, 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 and you know, killing some game or something. And the environment has changed so that things that feel good may not be good for you. And that's one way of describing this. You can turn around and describe that from a mimetic point of view, uh, but I don't think you'll really disagree fundamentally about what's, what's going on. And Susan? Uh, yes, I would agree there. Uh, there are other kinds of self-destructive behavior, like, for example, when people are deeply, deeply unhappy and in, in, in real emotional pain, physical pain can actually relieve that to some extent, so, so people will actually harm themselves to have a simple physical pain rather than a deep emotional difficult one. And that's really nothing to do with memetics. But there are possible memetic answers sometimes. There are certain viral memes that people can pick up. Um, I, I mentioned martyrdom earlier. The idea of becoming a martyr for a, for a religion or a cult or something like that that you have um, deeply imbibed during your lifetime can appeal for many reasons. You feel that you will be admired by other people, that your life will have had some purpose and so on and so on, and you may be prepared to kill yourself for that. It's made even more complicated if you have um, acquired a belief in life after death and you believe that if, if you, um, you know, die for a cause, you will go to heaven. So, so that would be a mimetic example, but I think there are, there are, the mimetics can't do everything in it to answer your question. Liz, Thank thanks you. a lot for your call. Liz joining us from Seattle. You're listening to Talk of the Nation from NPR News. Vancouver, Hello, Vancouver Washington. Uh, yeah, Larkin is in yes. a car somewhere yes, in I Vancouver, am. Washington. Hi there. What I would like to mention are a couple of things. One, that I've recognized that my brain is like a mousetrap. Once something gets in, I can't get it out. I can have the capacity to reason and maybe reject the concept, but I find months later all of a sudden that negative idea that I let in is still sitting there. The other thing that uh, comes to my mind is our, our ability, as you say, to choose, but thought has form. When we think some thoughts, we're actually creating consciousness, we're creating existence. If you can go back to the book by James Allen, on, uh, you know, when you think something, you're actually projecting yourself in that direction. And I think the more we talk about memes and the Internet and everything, it makes us, we have to be much more responsible for the thoughts we choose to think and the thoughts we choose to put out in the world because they are actually helping to create our world. Uh, another aligned uh, 
you might say, science is called cymatics, the effects of sound on matter. Dr. Hans Jennings, 15 years with the work out of Basel, Switzerland, on a small scale showed that sound actually does create form and matter out there. And, and it's not too far a jump to think that then as we speak and as we think thoughts, we're creating a certain amount of our own reality. And uh, I like the concept of means because it means we have to take more responsibility. Thank you for letting me on. Thanks a lot for your call, Lark. And uh, let's get a quick reaction from Susan Blackmore. Given the sort of uh, promiscuous meme production of 1999 and your head being bombarded by them, uh, whose, whose interests, whose ends are being served there? Well, well, our call of ads raised, raised the, the question of responsibility, and I think this is really tricky. I tend to take a really kind of thoroughgoing mimetic view that all that is happening in the world is the competition between replicators to be copied, and this is the design process. We are all unique creative people, but only by virtue of the memes. Now, then the responsibility really comes back to the memes and not us, and that's a tricky one that we need to think a lot about. Thanks a lot for being with us, Susan Blackmore. It's a pleasure. Susan Blackmore is the author of The Meme Machine and senior lecturer in psychology at the University of the West of England in Bristol. She joins us from the BBC studios in Bristol. Robert Wright, good to see you again. Thanks a lot, Ray. Robert Wright is author of The Moral Animal, Evolutionary Psychology and Everyday Life. Earlier we spoke to Richard Dawkins, author of The Selfish Gene and professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford University. His latest book is Unweaving the Rainbow. Talk of the Nation is produced by Ellen Silva and directed by Arun Rath. The production staff includes Sisi Modupe Fadupe, Setsuko Sato, Rina Okada, and Susan Lund. Our interns are Rick Martinez and Stephanie Purdy. Suzanne Mesnick is the technical director with engineering support from Marty Curseus, Michael Cullen, Renee Pringle, Susan Klein, and Brian Jarbo in Washington, and Chris Sackis in New York. We had help from program librarians Denise Chen, Giselle Foss, Beth Howard, Tom Tuzinski and Catherine Baer, Allison Denny, and music librarian Robert Goldstein. We had help from reference librarians Caleb Gisesi, T. Molesky, Rob Robinson, and Alphonse Vin. Pete Michaels is the executive producer. Come over in Kansas City and sing me the Patty Duke song. In Washington, I'm Ray Suarez, NPR News.